AI, short for automated imaging, is the latest trend in astronomy. What? Artificial intelligence. That sounds made up. So you want to take pictures of the eclipse, but also enjoy it with your eyes. So how do you do both at the same time? We as humans are incredible because we can multitask, but because of technology and automation, we don't have to. Today, I'll do a full overview of an app called Set and See, short for Solar Eclipse Timer and Controller. This software only works with Canon cameras on Windows machines, but I think this video will still be helpful for you even if you're using other programs such as Eclipse Orchestrator or Eclipse Maestro on other operating systems such as Mac OS and Linux. All of these programs may look different and act differently, but the concept of all of them is exactly the same. I picked Set NC because it looked interesting and it was compatible with all the hardware that I have, and its full software is absolutely free. This software only works with one camera at a time for now, so I'll be using multiple mini PCs during the total eclipse to automate three out of my four imaging rigs. First, we'll quickly go over three resources that you can use to help you understand what your ISO and exposure time should be for your setup. But I highly recommend testing your gear now and creating a panel of exposures of the sun. I went a little overboard before the last eclipse and created this panel showcasing images of the sun from four different setups. And then I determined that this image here at ISO 200 taken at 1 1,000th of a second exposure is my baseline. So moving forward, I'll be using ISO 200. Before we get into the resources, I want to first thank Robert Neufer who created Set and See. And when I had a question, I reached out to him and not only did he respond extremely quickly, but he gave me the perfect solution for my problem. I'll tell you more about that after the demo because it'll make more sense then. So let's dive in. One of the resources you can use to help you with your exposure timing and exposure settings is MrEclipse.com. It is run by Fred Espinek, who is a world-renowned eclipse chaser. And there's a lot of great information here, so I would recommend going through this at some point. Even just reading through this can help you a lot. And then if we scroll down here, there is a section for Solar Eclipse Exposure Guide. And this is what you can use to help you uh, with guidance. So the way this works is that there's intra instructions here, but I'll just quickly go over it, which is you pick the ISO you want to do. So let's say ISO 200. You pick your F number, your F ratio for your telescope or camera. Let's say you want to do uh, F 5.6. So it'll be this one. And then you just go straight down and then follow this. So for example, like once you're doing the partial eclipse, if this set, if this is what you want to do at F 5.6, you do one two thousandth of a second shutter speed. And then Bailey's beads, there's no values here, which I assume you can just do one four thousandth of a second here along with this chromosphere. And then prominences, you'd go up to one four thousandths and then Corona one one thousandths. So this is the exposure bracket during totality. The next resource we're going to look at is AstroPix. So there's some good exposure tables here as well that you can use as guidance. And again, this table is it's very similar to what we saw on Fred Espinex's website. So now we're going to go to the third resource, which is Javier Shujubia's website, who created an interactive shutter speed calculator. So you can just put in your values and then see what this recommends. Again, you should take this as a recommendation, a guidance, and not like you have to do this. Uh, we're going to first change the sensor type. So I know I'm going to be using a Canon T2 and T5i, which are both Canon APS-Cs. Focal length. I'm going to do 300. Effective megapixels is 18. And this gives you the exposure limit without tracking half a second. That's pretty good. So this is for sampling. Uh, we don't really need this. This is just to give you an idea of how sharp the sun may look. But I'll fill this out real quick. So yeah, my pixel size is 4.3 microns and then 1.85 arc seconds per pixel. The altitude of the sun, I know where I'll be. It will be on average 70 degrees above the horizon, which is pretty high. Elevation, I have no idea. It's not zero, I'm gonna put 10. And then we have all of these options here. So we're gonna start here. And the one thing I love about this form here is that it uses Thousand Oaks Optical Solar Light Filter. So that's what I'm using. The ISO or sensitivity defaults to 100, but as you saw, I really liked ISO 200. I'm gonna keep it at 200. And then for the aperture, the F ratio, the bolded numbers are some of the more common F ratios that we see out there. Um, so F4 is a good one. So I can keep it at F5.6. I can go up to F7.1, but I think I'll do F8 just to sh show you an example of what this will look like. So I can see that for the partial phase, for all of the partial phases, this website recommends 1 400th of a second shutter speed for those phases. And for other types of uh, natural density filters, you have these options. We're going to skip these. 
For annular Bailey's beads, we don't need those. But for Bailey's beads with total without the filter, so we click on this, it recommends one eight thousandth of a second. My old Canon T2i does not do more than one four thousandth of a second. So I'll just take this as one four thousandth of a second, or the fastest exposure setting that you can do. Makes sense. The chromosphere, it'll start going down. Again, it'll be one four thousandth of a second for prominences. That's better. I do have one thirty thirty two hundred. So we can keep going through this really quickly. You can see that it gets slower and slower until we start hitting like half a second, somewhere a quarter second, one one sixth, one point six, two seconds, and then finally for Earth Shine, it recommends four seconds. And if you notice that as I clicked through these, we this picture here updated with examples of what we should expect. So this is a really good resource. I recommend using this as guidance. Again, test your own settings with your own camera. So now we're going to hop onto my mini PC and we're going to install some stuff so we can try and control my Canon DSLR. All right, I am connected to my mini PC here and we are going to just Google set and see, and it's gonna be the first one. So this is created by Robert Neufer. All right, so this is the set and see website here. It's pretty simple. It's one single page of information. I'm not going to cover everything on this page now. I'm going to skip to what I think is useful, but I highly suggest that you go in and look through this yourself. The things I will point out is that you need to have Canon EOS utility running and they very nicely link to it. So I'll go to that in a second. And if you scroll down, it has a list of cameras that it works with. As I said earlier, this is Canon only unfortunately. So the Canon cameras I'll be using is 550D, which is T2i, and 700D, which is T5i. So this is going to work for me. I'm not going to go over all the PC checklist, but the, the two options that I think that you need to know is uh, that they recommend that you set the computer's time to universal time and disable automatically clock correction for DST just to make sure that the app time and your computer time remains the same, it'll be a lot easier for you. It also recommends you do the same thing for the camera. I haven't done that for this video, but I will go back and do that for my camera at some point. And you need to make sure your Canon's wheel position is set to M for manual. And you wanna make sure the review time is off. I'm scrolling down, there's not much here that we need to know that I won't go over. Uh, I will add that there was a recent update to allow Windows batch file execution so you can run batch files here. And this tickles my brain because I wanna think about ways I can automate some of the stuff here later on, but I'll leave this alone for now. I won't show you how to do batch files because that goes into programming, but that's about it. So we need to install Canon Utility. We'll go there and then the downloads for this is here. So I won't download that yet. So go to Canon Utility, find your camera, a little bit more. I know I have Canon T2i. If you have like Canon T7i, I'm gonna open this first, or one of the later Canons. If you scroll down, there's a utility, US Utility 3.7, which is the most current one that you can use for the newer cameras. For my old cameras, I need Canon EOS Utility 2, and Canon makes it the most annoying to find, and it took me a while to find a workaround, to find the file that I need. When it asks you for your operating system, it auto detects Windows 10, even though I'm on Windows 11. So if you go to Windows 8, like Windows 8 64 bit, it loads a bunch of other images or other files that you can download. And what you need is this one, the EOS Digital Solution Disk software for Windows, for users who cannot use the bundled CD. Great, so we're gonna download that. And it asks for the serial number. And when it, you put input the serial number of your camera, which is found at the bottom of your camera, it'll download a zip file, which I already downloaded and then extracted. And the zip file is called like KSD291A. And this is the packager. Uh, it has a bunch of other software. So I'm gonna double click and install this. Uh, do USA, Canada, United States, English. Don't do easy installation. I'm gonna do custom installation. Yes. and. If you did easy installation, it would have installed all of these. I don't need all of these. I don't need Digital Photo Professional. I do need US Utility too. This is the software I'm looking for. I don't need this. 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 Uh, this may come in handy, the lens registration tool, because uh, it is aberration correction data to camera. So I'll leave that, but everything else is going off and I'm gonna click next. 
yeah, your EOS utility too. Yes. Install. Super fast. Great. Okay. Next. No, not registering. Okay. Finish. There we go. Now we have Canon EOS utility somewhere here. Uh, Canon utilities, EOS utility too. So great. So now, or the trick here is to first turn the camera on. Well, at least that's what works for me. And then we're going to plug in our micro USB to here. Which way does it go? That's way. There we go. There we go. Alrighty. So now on my mini PC, I can turn on EOS utility. EOS utility. Camera settings and remote shooting. You can see that it already detected that, detected my Canon T2i here. Move this here. So now if I just click a random picture, you saw that it took a picture. So it's, uh, I think the lens cover is on, so it caught black, but great, it's working. So now we're gonna close this. We don't want this, we don't wanna keep this running because the there can only be one app connected to the camera at once. There we go. So now we're gonna go back to our browser and go back to set NC. And now we're going to download the latest version here. And then I'm going to open this file. Yes. And then run anyway. Put yes here. English, sure. I agree. Uh, read through this. I agree. Install. And then close. Perfect. So before I continue, I wanna make sure that I update my time to UT time as stated in the instructions. So to do that on Windows 11 on the bottom right hand side where the clock is, I'm gonna right click, adjust date and time. It'll open up this window. It's similar in Windows 10 and Windows 7, I believe. And what you wanna do is under set time automatically, turn it off. And then the time zone, we are going to set to zero or there is a UT time here somewhere. Here it is, uh, universal, coordinated universal time, UTC time. And when I click on this, you'll see that the adjust for daylight saving time automatically turns off. So we don't have to do that extra step in Windows 11, but in Windows 10, you need to, there's an extra checkbox that you need to turn off. So now you can see that my time is set to two o'clock on March 11th. So that is UT time. So I'm gonna close this. So now I can go to start and set and see. And it kind of looks like nothing happened. That's because this opened over the screenshot, kind of a perfect fit. So I'll close or minimize my Firefox window. And this is the UI. I'll quickly go over what the UI means. It can look a little bit intimidating the first time you look at it, but it is pretty simple. And it's pretty easy to understand once you start breaking it down. So I'll start from the top left. Um, we have our file. So two ways to quit, save coordinates or don't save coordinates. 25 degree latitude and 103 degrees west longitude is the defaults. Camera and exposure tables are not drop down. When you click on them, additional windows open up. We'll go through those individually in a little bit. Options, we have a couple of options. The first one is tenths of a second. So when you click on this, you'll see the time here. We'll have an extra option here where, extra value here where it goes by tenths of a second. It's a little bit too busy for me, so I'm going to turn that off. The other options are spoken commands and listen commands. So if you turn off spoken commands, uh, it won't speak any commands to you later on when we are going through the exposure table. So if you uncheck this, the listen commands goes away. So you need to make sure this is on. Okay. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so now you know that the sound is on. And if you want to test the commands, you do listen commands. And we have two options, remove filters and attach filters. So we'll click on this. Remove filters. There you go. And? Attach filters. Sounds great. Thank you. All right, those are the options. Form size, uh, this is kind of a zoom in, zoom out option. So normal means zoom in, so it looks way bigger. And then small means zoom out, goes back to normal size. And you can keep doing this to make it bigger and bigger. So smaller and smaller. There you go, works fairly well. And the about is just, you know, set and see version, what version you have. This is the latest version as of this video. On this here, we have a slider here where you can go through the eclipses all the way up to the year 2100 and go back to 2001. So it's just a slider, pretty simple, and this is where we are. And based on the eclipse that you select and the contact times here, update. And I think this is some kind of glitch where 
the information here gets hidden if you zoom in too much and then you zoom out. So the, uh, what to do here is restart it and there we go, back to normal. And before we get through the contact times, let's stay here. I'll come back to delta T later on. So the value here of 1817 or 620, 617 p.m. UT time, the greatest eclipse is the global greatest eclipse. So this will be somewhere over Mexico. So this isn't taking into account where your time zones are, where you are located or anything. I'll come back to delta T in a little bit. Geographic coordinates. So we need to manually input our coordinates. You can't click here to adjust the uh, crosshair. So I'm gonna go back to Firefox, open Google Maps and zoom in to where near where I'll be it won't be exactly where I am so I'll be near Marble Falls so I'll just click here and you can see the values of where you clicked down here so it's in Burnett County and if you click on this it'll actually take you there center it and then the URL here will update so now you can copy I'm going to copy this 30 point blah and go to set and see paste it here and then go back to Google and then I have my longitude so you don't need the negative because on set and see we're using north and west so we don't need negative or positive and I'm going to paste this here the height by default is 800 I don't think that's right where I'm going to be so I'm just going to do 50 I think 50 meters over sea level is good enough so I'll close this up and so now the crosshair updated as I updated these so it's now over Marble Falls in Austin great here we have my system time here at 208 a.m and the contact times here. So the first one and the last ones are global start and end of the partial eclipse. So this means that at 1542 or 342 p.m. UT time is when partial will begin on Earth. So which is gonna be like in the Pacific Ocean somewhere here, not where it will be where I am. That's contact one. So the upper value here, plus 28, is when the contact times for this eclipse begins. So I have 28 days, 15 hours, 7 minutes, and about 26 seconds before contact 1 starts. So pretty cool that it does a big countdown. So if I were to leave this on for 28 days, this would count down all the way down to zero, and then eventually it will trigger something based on what I am working on. So that's how you read this. Lots of numbers here, but it's pretty simple once you get the hang of it. So we have contact 1, 2, maximum totality, contact 3, 4, and then when partial ends globally. So here it'll be like somewhere like North Atlantic, I believe. And the values between C2 and C3 is when totality is. So you'll see that it's about four minutes and 14 seconds where this is, where I'll be is about four minutes and 18 seconds. So that's how you know I'm not exactly where I am. So on the right side here, we have the sun and moon position. And I was pretty close on Javier Jubier's website when I said the sun was going to be at a height of about 70 degrees. So it maxes out at 67 degrees between C2 and C3 and goes down to 60 degrees, give or take C4. And these rows here correspond to the rows here. So 60.7 degrees will be at C1, 67 at C2, and so on and so forth. And the values here are the vertex and the parallax, paralytic angles of the moon here. So that's all you need to know about the UI here. Pretty simple once you really understand what it means. Uh, so I did skip over the delta T. I'll explain what this is. So if you see there are some discrepancies in, between, in the contact times based on where you are and what this is giving you, you can actually click on delta T and you can adjust the time. So it changes from 69 to 75, but you can go down to like 71. And what that will do is if I turn this off, if you take a look at the C1 contact time, uh, it is 17.17. And if I turn this on, or 17.17.03, if I turn this on, it's now 17.17.00 because of the change in time that I just input it. So something to keep in mind if you need to adjust, you use the delta T. So there we go. So now we can start working on the camera and the exposure table. So we'll go to the camera first. And we get this window here and we'll click on connect camera. And because I have EOS utility in the background, it's able to connect to my T2i. And you can see that the screen on my T2i turned on uh, when I connected. So the, this window here is a single image window. And this is a really great way of testing that SetNC can indeed control your camera. So for image quality, I'll keep it at JPEG Shaddai. Well, I'm gonna go to RAW because that's what I'll be shooting at anyway. And these are all the options your camera has. I'll do RAW JPEG. The AE mode is just something to remind you to make sure that your camera is on manual mode. ISO auto, I'll do 200. 
the aperture value is f4, I'll change to f8. And then the time value is 1 4,000th of a second, I will change this to 1 1,000th of a second. And if you notice that on the camera itself, the values are changing as I update them here. So I'll do it one more time. You can see that it changed. And to test this, I just click on this button. It says release. There you go. I took a picture. Unlike US utility, I'm not going to get a preview here because ZNC does not do previews or does not get the files from there. So you'll have to trust that your camera is saving correctly to the SD card. You can check on it every once in a while, including using EOS utility. All right, that's this window. Next one, next tab, we have advanced camera test. From what the website says, this is mostly for testing for Robert. And you can test this as well, but there's really not a lot of value here. So if I just click on take five pictures, it tells you how fast it's taking it and how fast it's saving. And that's about it. So it's just a quick test. Next one is we have eclipse photography. So we'll come back to this after we do our exposure tables because those are necessary in order for this to work. Otherwise, if I test, click on test eclipse photography, we get a message, message that says no exposure table. So I'm going to leave that down here, put this up here. And then now I'm going to click on exposure tables. And we get a new pop-up window here called exposure table for solar, total solar eclipse. And it looks like another intimidating window, but don't worry, it's pretty simple as well. On the left side here, we have our camera defaults. Uh, it looks very similar to the camera window we saw here. And you'll notice that the interactive camera test values do not translate and transfer over here. So that's quite all right. We're going to change this to raw JPEG large fan. You could also just do raw, but I'm going to do JPEG as well to help me share my photos faster. Since I won't be home, it'll be harder for me to process. ISO, I'm going to do 200. And F ratio, I will do F8 because that is my plan. So in the next part, we have the partial phases take picture every option, and it goes from one minute to nine minutes. And this is telling you how often you want to take a picture. During the actual eclipse, if you have you know, capacity on your flash drive, you have battery power, etc. You could do one minute, take a picture every one minute. You're going to have a lot of files. The default is five minutes, which is fine. And for the testing purposes, I'm going to leave this at five minutes. Otherwise, it'll just create a whole lot of rows. And once we create the exposure table, I'll show you what that looks like. Next thing we have the near C2 and C3 Bailey's beads. It's just cut, cut off, but it's take pictures from negative eight seconds to plus eight seconds. And what this is saying is that around C2 and C3, how much earlier and how much later, how much after the C2 and C3 do you want to take pictures for Bailey's beads? And you have three options, six seconds, eight seconds, and 10 seconds. Default is eight seconds, and I'll show you what that looks like. And I think eight seconds is plenty, but you can also do 10 seconds if you want. And the last option is during totality. We only have one option here, and the option says to loop from one one thousandth of a second to four seconds as often as possible. So during totality, it'll just keep taking pictures as much as it can from this exposure to that exposure. Some people like doing eight second exposures as well for a super bright moon for extra earth shine. And to do that, you click on the options and you click on max exposure equal eight seconds by default is four seconds. The UI here, the user interface will not update and say four seconds, but when you when we create the exposure table, eight seconds will be checked. We'll look at that later. So by default, we'll just keep it at four seconds for now. And when you're ready, you click on create exposure table and we get an Excel like spreadsheet that we can look at, edit and manipulate how we want. Quickly going over the options on the left hand side, we have wave and batch files, batch files. So wave files are already included, which will tell you to remove filters and attach filters. You can also include batch files, which I'm not going to go over in this video. The second column is phase or file. These are generated automatically, but you can edit them if you want. If you're using a WAV file or a batch file, you need to input the names here. Third column is pretty self-explanatory. It's the UT time at which the set and C will take pictures. So you want to make sure that your computer matches UT time so that it knows how to do this. Next column is image quality. So this is something that you can edit, but I would highly advise against because the way it's written, the spelling needs to be exact. And you can see the other options by clicking on this here and looking on this drop down option and look at all of them. So you can copy and paste that here. But if you make a mistake, you could end up ruining your whole session because it, I think it'll error out. Fifth column, we have the ISO, so 200. You can also edit these individually. So if you want to take ISO 100 and 200, you can do that. 
And the next column here is the F ratio. If your camera allows you to automatically change it, then you can change it here. There are some lenses that won't let you do it. Talk about that later. And finally, the rest of the columns are just the exposure times, and it goes from 1 8,000th of a second, which my camera cannot do, to 8 seconds, which my camera can do, and it, that's something you can do. By default, the partial phases are taken at 1 1,000th of a second, 1 500th of a second, and 1 2 50th of a second, which is pretty good for HDR. If you want to do, for example, 1 2,000th of a second, you can also do that. Just double-click, edit, and click on it input an X. Same for all the other ones, however many you want to do it. Pretty easy. If you want to remove one, edit it, and then delete it. Double click, edit, delete. One thing to know about this is that if you make changes manually to anything, and then you click on create exposure table again, it will overwrite what you have. So this is like going back to the past. And at this point, I'll tell you that you can save your exposure tables by going on file. You can click on save exposure table. So this will save a default file. Or you can do save exposure table as. And you can see that I already have one here, which you can save as, like I'll do test two here, as test two here. And it'll save as another file. So if I go back here, we have three set exposure tables here that I can edit. And these are basically just CSV files. If I open this one, you see that this is what it looks like. So you can open up, open this up in Excel or Google Sheets or something. And it has your GPS coordinates and then the, and then the rows that we see in the exposure table. So you can make exposure table changes here. So I can do like X here. And then let's do X, X, X. And then if I save it, control S, Minimize this, minimize this, and I go back here. Now, if I click on File, Open Exposure Table, click on this one, Open, you'll see that more of these will get Xs, so Open, there you go. So you can make edits in Excel or your spreadsheet editor of choice, just like this. Pretty cool, I think. Next, if we scroll down, we have our Remove Filter audio file that will play about a minute or so before Bailey's Beat start at C2, right before C2. And this is the option that we saw here. So you see that it says C2 minus eight seconds. So we have eight exposures here being taken right before C2 starts to try and capture Bailey's beads. If I were to set this to 10 seconds, link negative 10 seconds, if I click on create exposure tables, it'll overwrite my default, my customizations. And if I scroll down, you'll see that now there are 10 exposures before Bailey's beads, before C2. 10 exposures after C2. And then we have the same thing with C3. So 10 before and 10 after. So you wanna look at this and see how often you wanna do it. And it takes one picture every second at ISO 1 1,000th of a second. Sorry, at exposure 1 1,000th of a second. Right, because I redid this, it did change my ISO. So I'm just going to open this back up. All right, so now we went over Bailey speeds, easy. And now we have this loop here, this is loop until totality. And you can see that every exposure from one one thousandth of a second to four seconds has an X on it. If you wanna do another one, two thousandths, you can do that as well. If you don't create the exposure table by clicking on options, set exposure second to eight seconds, you wanna do eight seconds, you can just double click here, X, put it in there, and now it'll do an eight second exposure. But I'll take that off. And then once that's over, we're into C3 phase, and then both here, attach filters, and then we have the ending partial phase images that are being taken every five minutes. And it'll take one final one at the very end. So now we can test this to make sure that our setup actually works. So how do we do this? That's where this window comes back into play the last tab, Eclipse Photography. So you can click on Test Eclipse Photography. What this will do is it'll just loop through all of these one after another without any delay. So I'll click on this, it'll show you what that will do. So listen. And you can see what the values it is taking. So ISO 200, F8, 130. And it's doing two seconds. So this is the beginning of the partial eclipse. So th that was because I was I had this. So now it's doing all of these. If you had different names for each of these, you'd see that pop up. Oops, you see that pop up here. So I'm going to abort this because I'm just going to keep doing it. And the way we should test is using the start eclipse photography test. And when you click on this, 
you have this warning here that says warning, pressing advanced time sets the program to rehearsal mode. So right now, it's waiting 28 days, 14 hours, 35 minutes, 46 seconds before it takes this first picture. I don't wanna do that. So when you click on advanced time, it'll set this entire application into rehearsal mode. And also we'll take the time we wait from 28 days to five seconds. So watch, advanced time, five seconds, there we go. So now it'll take the first picture. There we go. And it is looping through each of these exposures that we picked all the way up until two seconds because I included that. And after it's done, it goes back to waiting the regular amount of time, which is five minutes. So we have four minutes, 40 seconds left until the next one. And you click on advanced time again, and it'll go back to five seconds. And then it'll take three exposures for me at the various time values here, and then it'll keep waiting. So this is a really good way of going through each of these, make sure that all of your exposures are working, your camera is able to save. Another good way to to test this would be, so I'm going to click on, you know, back to real time and abort. We'll come back to this. And so we can manipulate this table to make it, make testing a little bit easier. So, and that's where we will talk about how to add and remove rows here. So it's not really intuitive. Uh, unlike editing, you can just double click and then edit. To add or remove, what you wanna do is right click on the row headers here. Just click anywhere, right click and you get four more menu options. The insert line, insert before, insert after, delete line, and done. So you click on done, it closes. You need to do it on the rows here, not the columns. If you right click here, nothing happens. So you right click here, you get that. So insert before, it'll insert one here based on where I'm selecting. So if I select this, insert before, it'll select, create a line there. And then what you can do is, if you want to just duplicate something, you can copy this, so select that, control C for copy, go here, and then control V for paste, and it pastes that exact line. So, but you wanna make sure that the timing is a little bit different, otherwise, it's not that big of a deal in the partial eclipse phases because it'll just wait and, and go through them as they're finished. But during totality and Bailey speeds, you may wanna be careful when you copy and paste and edit lines. And insert after is pretty self-explanatory, and delete line is pretty self-explanatory. So, for my testing, what I like doing is, I'll select the first one. I'll just delete a whole bunch of these until I get, I have just one left. It's a one partial phase. I will get rid of one of the remove filters, audio prompts. And we have eight Bailey's Bees, but to make it faster, I'm going to delete three of them. You can't select multi and then delete them. It'll just delete the first ones. So if I, you'll see that I only deleted one. So I'm gonna delete three of them. So we have five and we delete three of them here. One, two, three, it doesn't matter which ones. And then I'll delete these here. So it's gonna be after totality. There we go. I'll remove one of the attach filters. And then at the very end here, I'm going to delete all of them until I have just one partial phase left. There we go. So now we have 27 rows and it'll be taking all of these pictures. Let's scroll here. Yeah. There we go. So we only have uh, two partial phases where it'll take three exposures for, that's our eclipse bracketing or our image bracketing there. And our exposure bracketing for totality is there. So now when we have this set up, we can go back to the camera window here, click on eclipse photography and then start eclipse photography. And then we can click on advanced time to get into rehearsal mode. So now we have five seconds until the first partial eclipse phase is starting and there's our image, three of them. And then there's a three minute wait until the remove filters audio file gets played, but I can click on advanced time to go move forward and remove filters. Thank you, Robert. So now once this disappears, we'll see that there's 49 seconds left. I don't want to wait 49 seconds. So advanced time again, go down to five seconds. You can reset this by clicking on advanced time. It's a loophole if you need more time. And now it'll start taking images every second for Bailey's beats. So it starts at five, four, three, two, one. And you can see what it's taking by looking at this information here. So now it's looping during totality for about four minutes. And it is taking, you can see the values here. So one, one, 30th, 1 15th, 1 8th, 1 quarter, half a second, 1 second, 2 seconds, 
and then four seconds. If we had an eight second one here, it would have also taken that. And now it's taking, there, that was the four second one. So now it's starting over at one two thousandths and it's gonna keep doing it for four minutes as many times as it can. And the speed at which it takes these depends on your camera, on how fast it can save your memory card, how fast your memory card is. So to leave this loop here, what you can do is click on advanced time and then it will, there you go, it's, now it's five seconds under Bailey speeds. And now we are here right before C2 or C3. There we go. And I will let the rest of it finish because we have just two more shots left, attach filters. And then that's in 17 seconds, advanced time. Filters. Thank you. And once that disappears, we will be nine minutes until the ending partial phase eclipse picture gets taken, which is nine minutes, 20 seconds. And I can click on advanced time, five seconds. And then we will take our final three images, 500, 250, 1000. There we go. And that's done. So now we did a full test from beginning to end. And this is what we can expect using this application I'll click on done, close this. This is what we can expect, expect using this application during the eclipse. What I didn't do in my exposure table is make the small adjustments as recommended by Jubier's website, especially around Bailey's beads. During my actual run of the eclipse, I plan on turning some of those one one thousandths of a second exposures to one four thousandths of a second so that I can cover more of the spectrum. And like I said, these resources should only be used for guidance and you should definitely test your own gear to figure out what works for you. And if you use Gordon Telepin Solar Eclipse Timer app, you can add in or edit some of the partial phase exposures here to coincide with what the app recommends. And right before I leave for my trip, I'll share my finalized exposure tables with everyone. While watching the demo, some of you may have thought, where are the other exposure times? That's a great question. And that's exactly what I reached out to Robert Newfer about. And he told me that the general user doesn't need the finer exposure intervals. And I understand where he's coming from because the user interface would have looked clunky. And sometimes we have to protect the user from themselves. Looking at my crazy panel again, an exposure of one eight hundredth of a second doesn't look much different from one one thousandth of a second. You don't see a difference unless you are two to three steps away. And that's what SetNC has. All of the exposure values that we are able to see are about two to three steps apart. So I completely understand it. What do you think about it? And just because I understand it doesn't mean that I didn't want the finer controls for myself personally. And thankfully, in that same email response, Robert Newfer provided me with a link to the extended version of the app. And that looks like this with the finer exposure intervals. So thank you, Robert, I really appreciate it. And I haven't decided yet if I'm going to use the extended version of the app during the actual eclipse. I was very nicely asked not to share that extended version with the public, so you will not find a link to that in the description below, but you will find a link to the regular set and see webpage in the description. But if you wanna talk about it anyway, in a couple of days, I'm going to announce a new way that you can communicate with me, so stay tuned for that. I plan on using SetNC for three of my four imaging rigs for the Eclipse. My fourth setup is a Hydrogen Alpha setup, which has a completely different workflow. And if you're using SetNC or any other image automation software, I'd love to hear about it. I was planning on doing a follow-up video on Eclipse Orchestrator since it is pretty popular, but I don't think I'll have time since I only have about two weeks left before I need to start packing. And for those of you who don't know, we will be driving down from Boston to Austin taking four days because we are driving with an 11 month old. So we're going to take our time to get there. So we'll see how that goes. Clear skies.